about a project that I worked on recently with some colleagues, and we explored a lot of role of working memory in second language writing. So far in writing research, um, the emphasis has been the end products of writing, the text that learners produced, and there is a gap in research on the writing processes, on the behaviors, and also the cognitive processes that underline writing behaviors. So the aim of our larger project with Maria Michelle from the University of Groningen and Nijin Lee, who is now at USN University in Korea, she used to be my PhD student, so the, they were my collaborators, and our aim was to investigate the speed fluency, pausing, and revision behaviors of second language writers and associated cognitive processes. To achieve this aim, we triangulated several data sources, including introspective methods, in particular stimulated record, also keystroke logging, eye checking, and working memory. And in this talk, I'll be focusing on our results on working memory, because this is the most relevant to the theme of the colloquium. Why uh, working memory and how does that relate to uh, writing processes? There's this very prominent second language acquisition researcher, Robert de Kaiser, who wants to understand. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> One way to understand cognitive processes which are hard or impossible to observe is to inform them from the way individual difference variables interact with linguistic variables. Okay? And when it comes to second language writing, one of the individual difference variables uh, appears to be working memory, as has been put forward by first language um, researchers such as Kellogg, who is someone who is an expert on first language writing, and also in the area of second language acquisition, Judith Kormosh made that link. For the purposes of our research, we adopted a Badly's working memory model. This model describes working memory in terms of a supervisory system, the central executive, and also three slave systems, the visual spatial sketchpad, the episodic buffer, and the phonological loop. The central executive controls complex cognitive operations, such as focusing, dividing, and switching attention, updating and monitoring information, and also inhibiting processing routines. The phonological uh, loop is responsible for temporary retention and manipulation of verbal information. And finally, the visual spatial sketchpad is specialized for storing and handling visual information. The other theoretical framework that informed our study was Kellogg's model of writing. This model conceptualizes writing in terms of three processes, formulation, execution, and monitoring. When we formulate what we would like to write, we plan the text, the content and organization of the written piece. Then we translate that uh, plan into linguistic form through linguistic encoding processes such as lexical retrieval, syntactic encoding, and expression of cohesion. Then at the execution stage, we use motor movements to produce either a type or a handwritten text. When we write, we also monitor our performance, we read it what we've written, we also edit the evolving text to make sure that it actually reflects the intended content. All these processes work in parallel, this is an interactive model. Kellogg also made some predictions how working memory might be implicated in the writing process. According to him, executive control will be implicated at all stages because it's an interactive model and we constantly have to pay attention to all these stages. According to him, phonological short-term memory will also be involved at the translation and monitoring stages because these stages involve uh, the manipulation, the processing of verbal information. Visual spatial sketchpad, he would um, argue or he would uh, predict, is going to be important at the planning stage because when we plan what we would like to write, we have pre linguistic ideas. And pre linguistic ideas often involve images as well. When it comes to monitoring, if you have a good visual spatial sketchpad, perhaps we remember better where certain parts of the text were on the screen or on the paper that might help. So far, very little research has looked into the relationship between second language writing and working memory. Let me just summarize the findings of this line of research. Kormos and Shafar uh, looked, uh, found um, a positive relationship between phonological short-term memory and learners' performance on a Cambridge first certificate uh, test. And in an early, uh, another study, there was a relationship found between spelling and phonological short-term memory. In a more recent study, uh, Zabidea found executive control to be important in writing. Uh, she found that better updating ability was associated with greater accuracy on complex writing tasks. And finally, in the most recent study on second language writing, Michel Atoll um, found a limited role in one out of five TOEFL junior tasks. Uh, these were all writing tasks, um, and again, it was a moderate um, uh, role for working memory there. 
But so far, none of these studies have looked into the role of working memory in writing behaviors and processes. All of these studies have considered the writing product being a resulting text, so this was a gap we wanted to fill in our research. So our research question, among many, but the one which I'll be talking about today was, to what extent are phonological short-term memory, visual short-term memory, and executive control related to speed fluency, posing, and revision behaviors in second language writing? The participants were 30 Chinese L2 users of English. They were all international students at the University of London. They had IELTS scores seven or higher, the majority were female, and the mean age was around 27. What did they do? First, they performed an IELTS academic writing task. While they were writing, we used the input box software, a keystroke logging software, to record their uh, keystrokes and mouse movements. And we also had a Toby eye checker, uh, which recorded the eye movements of the participants while they were writing. Then they were administered a typing test. Part of the students, only uh, 12 of them, uh, participated in a stimulated recall session. And then we administered to them a relatively large working memory test. The IELTS academic writing task had this prompt. Maybe I'll just give you a bit of time to read it. Okay. Yeah, you get the idea, typical IELTS prompt. When it comes to working memory tests, we had tests of phonological short-term memory, visual short-term memory, and also executive functioning tests, a test of updating ability, task switching ability, and inhibitory control. Let me show you, let me explain in detail what these tests uh, were. A phonological short-term uh, memory test, one of these was a non-word span test. It was adopted from Zhao's work. What participants had to do is repeat a series of Mandarin Chinese non-words, which increased in length from two to nine words. And participants' number span was specified as the highest number of non-words they were able to repeat correctly. The digit span test had a similar format, but this time participants were asked to repeat digits instead of non-words. This was also administered in Mandarin. The visual short-term memory test was the Corsi blocker task. This was administered by an inquisit lab, and this is the way it looked. The uh, participants first saw patterns of nine blocks, like this. Then, for each trial, two to nine blocks were highlighted. So one, two, three, do you remember them? And what they had to do, they had to click the blocks in the same order they've seen them. So like this, one, two, three. The number of highlighted blocks gradually increased from two to nine, and the visual span, again, was the highest number of uh, blocks or the sequences that participants were able to correctly repeat. We also had a backward Corsi block a test, which was an um, 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 executive, function, executive function test involving uh, visual uh, memory. It was exactly, it has the same format as the forward Corsi block uh, task, but at this time, participants had to click uh, the blocks in the reverse order. So it looked like this. Okay, and then what they had to do is this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And this is more demanding than the forward one. We used the operation test as a test of updating ability. First participants saw the math operation, like this. Then they had to check their score. And then a letter was displayed, like this. I hope you're trying to remember this. This was repeating three to seven times, depending on the set size. So here come two more. Let's see how we're doing. And then something like this appeared on the screen, and they had to click the letters uh, in the same order that they've seen them. So what was the first letter? Yes, and then? Yes, and then? Well done. Okay, the score, it was based on the accuracy criteria, so they had to be accurate on the uh, operations at least 85% uh, uh, of the time. And then uh, um, the score was based on correctly recalled letters. If they could recall three sequences, then they got three points, four, then four points. If they couldn't do, let's say, the fifth uh, the sequence or the set, including five sequences, then it's zero points. So then in this case, the total would be seven. Then we also had a color shape task, which was a test of task switching ability. Participants were instructed to evaluate either the color or the shape of colored shapes. So we had green or red, or red and triangle. In so-called non-switching blocks, the participants only had to make a decision about the color or the shape. 
Okay, so here, cover, triangle, circle, shape. Oh, I did it wrong, right? <laughs> For the cover, and then we have the shape. And when it comes to a switching block, uh, they require these are changing. So it's much faster. Color, then shape, and then color, and then shape again, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, much more difficult because they have to switch uh, between these cues. And the first performance was expressed at switching course. The difference in reaction times between switching and of inhibitory control. Again, this was also administered by an inquisit lab. An error appeared on the screen, and participants had to decide whether it um, was directed towards the left or towards the right, so like this. But this was not the only thing they had to do. Sometimes there was an auditory signal like beep, and if they heard this, then they were not supposed to react, okay? So like this beep, you're not supposed to say it, and then it's uh, right, and then also there should have come a beep, and then you're not supposed to react, so you have to inhibit it um, uh, yourself. The score was computed based on the percentage of direction errors, also the proportion of successful stops, and we had reaction times for goal trials and also for stop signal react uh, reaction times for when participants have to stop the signal. Our data analysis involved looking at the keystroke logs. This is one type of output that you get from the input log software. It shows what the participants wrote and also what they deleted. Uh, it also shows the place of pauses and also the length of pauses. Here we had a pause of 7,348 milliseconds and it appeared between the words history and. Okay. Function keys are also recorded, so this participant did basically uh, deleted everything, <laughs> almost that they written. And we also have information about mouse clicks. There are much friendlier outputs as well. We can get automatic indices of fluency uh, and pausing behaviors and this is what we looked at. Fluency was measured by words per p-burst. P-burst is uh, the number of words of p-burst is the period between two pauses. It's like a uh, pause burst. And characters between that p-burst. When it comes to pausing behaviors, we looked at the length of pauses and also the number of pauses per 100 words. And we also looked at the location of these pauses, whether they occurred within words, between words, or between sentences. And the reasons why we were interested in the location of pauses is because we know from previous research, both first language acquisition research and second language acquisition research, that if you pause at lower texture units such as within words or between words, we tend to focus on linguistic encoding processes. But when we pause at higher texture units between sentences or paragraphs, we tend to be more concerned with what we're trying to say. So it's more about content or organization. We also looked at revision behaviors. We had uh, indices of total amount of revision. We con considered the total number of words that were produced in the text and the number of produced overall throughout the writing process. And we also looked at the location of revisions, whether they occurred below the word level, whether a word was revised, below the close level, at the close level, or the close level, and above. When it comes to eye tracking, what we did first, we identified pauses in the keystroke logging software. Our pause threshold was two seconds. And then we looked for the same location in the eye tracking data. And then we did what we looked at the uh, gaze behaviors during the pause. Whether participants stayed at the point of inscription while they were writing, whether they looked at the previous word, they just written the previous clause, sentence, paragraph, they looked somewhere off screen or elsewhere. Let me show you a few examples, hopefully this is going to work. So here's a pause, and then the participant looks back in the previous sentence in this case. Remember, if we didn't have eye tracking, we could just be guessing where they were looking. So it was really nice to triangulate these various data sources. In this case, the participant goes back in the previous paragraph during the pause. Just reading uh, part of it. And one more, when the participant looks at the instruction uh, and, there is the pause, and also goes back in the paragraph a bit. Okay. Um, we then uh, stream and correlation analysis to investigate how the working memory measures related to the speed fluency pausing and revision measures and also the IDs behaviors. We decided to go with a less conservative alpha level because we had relatively small number of participants and uh, we uh, categorize correlations according to Plonsky and Oswald's field specific uh, criteria, um, 0 0.25, um, 40, and 0 0.60 were considered small, medium, and large, respectively. 
So just to remind you of the research question, we were interested in investigating to what extent are phonological short-term memory, visual short-term memory, and executive control related to speed, fluency, posing, and division behaviors. We also have, or should also have ideas behaviors here. So here are the results for the fluency and working memory measures. What we found that greater fluency, which was measured by words and characters per characters, was associated with better task reaching ability as measured by the color shape task and also a higher visual span. And then we were trying to think uh, what this could mean. Maybe those who are more fluent uh, writers probably be better able to switch among the various uh, writing processes such as planning, linguistic encoding, and execution, which could lead to more fluent behavior. When it comes to the visual spatial, oh, uh, I also wanted to mention that it's actually quite well aligned with Kellogg's model, who predicted that executive control uh, would be um, involved at various stages of the writing process. When it comes to visual span, uh, maybe better visual spatial sketch ability might help with planning, as I mentioned all earlier, linguistic ideas often involve images. Or maybe those who have better visual spatial sketch pad are better at spelling, and that could also help with fluency. When it comes to the visual spatial sketch pad, it uh, again is implicated in the planning stage, according to Caleb, but he wouldn't uh, posit a role for the visual spatial sketch pad at the translation stage, but maybe um, it could also be um, relevant there, and you will get to see we have stronger evidence uh, for this from the data. What about pausing and working memory? What we found that when participants um, had shorter pauses between words and sentences, they tended to have better task pitching ability. And also when participants had fewer pauses within words, they had higher uh, visual span. Remember, pauses between words uh, need, uh, often are related to linguistic encoding processes, whereas pauses between sentences tend to be more related to planning processes. So maybe those people who have better task switching ability, um, for them it might be easier to switch, I think, uh, to switch between planning and translation processes and also execution processes when they write. This could be one possible explanation for this. Again, this reflects uh, Callow's model of writing. When we pause within words, maybe one possible reason for that uh, could be, and why this is related to visual span is that those who have better, better visual spatial sketch, but maybe they have better spellers, they have a better memory of how words are written, um, which could, uh, and if you don't have uh, that ability, maybe you have to pause more often within words because you're thinking about uh, spelling, that's one possibility. So again, maybe there is a place for uh, having visual spatial sketch pad also mm -hmm. uh, in Kellogg's model when it comes to the role of working memory. Mm -hmm. Almost there, revision and working memory. Um, but we found that more revision uh, overall and also revision of words was related to better updating ability and better task switching ability. Again, if we have better updating ability, it means that we're better able to remember what we've just been written. And what we've just written, if, if we remember that better, maybe we're more likely to revise it because it's still um, in our memory. So uh, that could be one way to explain uh, this result. We also found that those who had better task switching ability uh, enabled writers to switch better um, um, or revise more. Maybe, again, they were able to better switch between composing and revision processes. And again, when it comes to monitoring, executive control in Kellogg's model was also um, positive. And finally, how do working memory measures relate to the eye gaze uh, measures? What we found that when participants uh, went back to the instruction less often or looked at the previous sentence or paragraph less often, they tended to have better executive control in terms of uh, visual measures and also better task switching ability and better inhibitory control. Also, those participants who looked uh, fewer times off screen, they had better inhibitory control. Better executive skills, better ability to focus attention on the instruction and evolving text might have allowed participants uh, to keep this information in memory, and maybe that's why they didn't have to go back so often and to look at these um, parts of the text. The last one is quite obvious, right? If you are easily distracted, maybe in the lab, you might be looking at the researcher, maybe you know the windows, and you're not focusing on the text. So there would be fewer looks uh, on the off screen if you have better individual uh, control. So what did we find in terms of ideas behavior? Again, executive functioning seemed to play um, a role. 
So that's to summarize, uh, we did find that working memory uh, was implicated in speech fluency, pausing, revision behaviors, and also eye gaze behaviors. And uh, interestingly, you might remember, I presented the studies earlier when we looked at the relationship, which looked at the relationship between working memory and linguistic outcome measures. They found relatively few relationships. But when it comes to the process, we had many um, uh, significant uh, links, which is not surprising, I think, because when we, you know, the process of writing, which is an online uh, process, um, is more likely to involve uh, working memory. In terms of the model, um, again, we found some support for this model, especially the role of executive control um, in Callow's model. Interestingly, there were no relationship between phonological short-term memory and the writing behaviors. Um, but we did find, again, some evidence for the um, involvement of the visual spatial sketchpad. Some implications, again, we found partial support for Kellogg's model. In terms of methodology, I didn't talk uh, so much about this in this presentation, but we found it quite fruitful to triangulate these various data sources, such as keystroke logging, stimulated recall, and the working memory uh, uh, measures and eye checking. Also, it was quite helpful to have a large battery of, uh, battery of working memory tests because in this way, we were able to assess various functions of working memory, which is still quite mm -hmm. rare in the SLE literature. Several limitations. One obvious limitation is we had highly proficient R2 writers. Maybe that could be the reason why we didn't find any effects for phonological short-term memory. Our eye checking measures were quite rough. This was qualitative coding. The post threshold was relatively long. Also, we didn't consider the various stages of the writing process, and we know from writing research that people tend to do different things at the beginning, towards the middle, and end of writing, so it would also be interesting to relate this to working memory. And I'm going to stop here, and I'd like to thank the IELTS British Council for financial support and uh, uh, for help with coding Chiave Sun and Bimali Indra Rathne. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you.